So we've all heard of the magical coveted cheat day, a magical day that happens once a week where you can just eat whatever you want and you don't see any consequences. You get the cravings out of your system and then it's right back on your diet on Monday. And you really don't see any kind of adverse effects to your fat loss journey. Well, I think that these cheat days should be left in the fairy tale books with the unicorns uh, and the damsels in distress. They simply don't happen without consequences, and it might be the major reason why you're not seeing progress with your fat loss. So in this video, I wanna cover the uh, myths surrounding cheat days and how we can safely and intelligently reintroduce our favorite foods without completely sabotaging our gains. So first off, a cheat day, as most meatheads would describe it, is one day a week where you're allowed to eat ad libitum. The psychology behind this is you can get the cravings out of your system and get right back to your strict meal plan and it kind of like re-motivates you to, to keep dieting. There's several problems with this uh, that we're gonna dive into. So reintroducing hyper palatable, hyper processed foods makes your weight loss more difficult. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shorten the word hyperpalatable, hyperprocessed to HP foods. This is due in part to the foods that you're using for your cheat day. Uh, nobody is cheating with broccoli, chicken, and rice, right? You're probably cheating with ice cream and pizza. These foods, ice cream, pizza, cookies, these foods are hyperpalatable, hyperprocessed. Hyperpalatable, meaning very delicious, very stimulating. Hyperprocessed, which means it's hyper engineered to be hyperpalatable. Using things like refined grains and sugars, high fructose corn syrup, high levels of fat. I'll talk about this in another video, but these foods have been shown to be highly addicting by design. These foods are addicting because they stimulate the part of the brain that gives us a massive dopamine dump. So it's a major reward and our brain chases rewards regularly. So if you have a food that is very easy to get and it delivers a massive dopamine boost, it's gonna cause an addiction. Now, much like an alcoholic trying to recover from alcohol or a smoker trying to cut out cigarettes, the best method to eliminating these cravings and overcoming your addiction is complete cessation, not periodic reintroduction. HP foods are exactly the same way. It makes no sense to keep these highly addictive, highly stimulating foods in your diet. You're not getting it out of your system. You're letting it back in your system. Now, the brain works in contrast constant comparison to its external stimuli. We know dark because we know light. We know loud because of quiet. So if you're regularly introducing these foods that flood your brain with dopamine, then by contrast, your healthy meals will be seen as boring because these foods, while they may be tasty, in contrast to these hyper palatable foods are not as tasty. So when you stop eating garbage food, you stop craving garbage food. So now next thing is cheat meals do not boost metabolism. A major claim made by meatheads is uh, a weekly cheat day can actually reverse the uh, common metabolic adaptations that we see from dieting. This day one of eating ad libitum will boost metabolism back to normal, uh, which makes weight loss faster. So first off, there's no evidence for this. And in fact, the data suggests otherwise. Now, I do believe that regular diet breaks can in fact return metabolic functions back to baseline. That's the reason why we recommend a four week diet break for every 10% uh, of total body weight that you lose. But a diet break is a long period of time where we eat at our estimated maintenance. It's not a weekly binge day. So another thing to keep in mind is a cheat day can completely sabotage your caloric deficit. So let's do some quick math here. Let's say that your current meal plan and training plan puts you at a caloric deficit of 700 calories a day. In seven days, this puts you at a total deficit of about 4,900 calories. That's the equivalent of about one pound of body fat used up and expended. Now let's say that you want a coveted cheat day because of the myths that I previously mentioned. You start out your cheat day and you go to IHOP and you get some uh, massive pancakes, then you have some snacks in between, and then you go out for an 18 inch pizza for lunch, and then you do a buffet for dinner. Not uncommon of a cheat day for someone, especially if they're uh, starving themselves. One could easily consume over 5,000 calories in one cheat day. In fact, it was a regular occurrence for me when I was competing in strongman. Me and my comrades uh, could easily put down 8,000 to 10,000 calories in one day. That's a gigantic surplus. This one gigantic surplus on one day can completely wipe out the deficit that you worked so hard to accrue over the last six days of the week. Push your luck hard enough and you could actually end up gaining weight on a weekly deficit with a cheat day at the end of the week. So does this mean that you're stuck eating the same monotonous low calorie foods for the rest of your life or at least until you hit your goal weight? Not necessarily. 
there is a way to provide a psychological and physiological break from the day-to-day -day diet, but it needs to be set up in a systematic approach. This is where novelty meals come in. So during my time working with the top neuroscientists in dopamine and productivity research, I learned about a concept called the novelty threshold. Now, the novelty threshold suggests that the brain uh, will eventually meet its dopaminergic limits with anything that has become monotonous. A, a video game that was exciting is now boring. A new routine that really excites you now becomes dull. Uh, a new hot, sexy girlfriend now just becomes kind of mid. A food that used to be exciting now becomes boring. These are all perfect examples of meeting the novelty threshold. Taking a break from this routine or introducing something novel can refresh this threshold. So this allows for us to continue to feel excited about the work that we're doing, and it will motivate us to continue to work until we get the task done. This is why I created Novelty Meals. Now, this is vastly different from the concept of cheat days or even cheat meals. First, calling it a cheat insinuates that you're doing something wrong. Okay, food has no morals, okay? It doesn't know good, bad, right, wrong. So it really makes no sense to call it cheating. You're not being unfaithful to anybody here. Second, a well-structured novelty meal can provide a psychological break and it can provide the light at the end of the tunnel during a diet. Now here's something really cool. There's research that shows that the occasional hypercaloric meal can actually boost performance and toggle the body from a catabolic breaking down state into an anabolic building up state. Now, anecdotally speaking, we've seen that novelty meals can create a whoosh effect in the body. This is where we see kind of a sudden drop in weight after introducing a novelty meal. So your, your weight might be stagnant for a few days. We introduce a novelty meal, the weight drops, you lose like two pounds. Um, the mechanism of this isn't very clear, but what I posit is this is possibly due uh, to the body releasing any stored water that's retained from stress from being in a controlled starved state. So how do we set up novelty meals for success and not sabotage. Number one, novelty meals should always be planned. They should never be random. Okay, so remember when you're dieting, you're already prone to making bad decisions based off of stress and emotion. Decisions that are based off of stress and emotions are hardly ever good decisions. So we wanna make sure that we have a novelty meal that's planned at least four or five days out in advance. Setting it once a week works just fine. We've seen that one novelty meal every five to seven days tends to scratch that itch. Next is we wanna to try to time it post-workout. So through our explanation of the Metaflex protocol, which is a protocol that we use internally with our clients, we've shown that the best time for hypercaloric feeding is when you're in a prime state for growth, insulin sensitivity, and glycogen depletion. We've also seen that there's a less likelihood of fat regain um, if the uh, refeeding of calories are timed around a heavy training session. So in the interest of staying lean while enjoying your novelty meal, we wanna time it four to eight hours post-workout. We wanna try to stick to uh, high carb and as low fat as possible. It, you know, it's always funny when people tell me that they're addicted to carbs and they point to ice cream and pizza and cookies. <laughs> when you look at the uh, macronutrient breakdown of these foods, they're actually very high in fat. They're not high in carbs. So carbs are not the enemy here. The issue lies in the perfect formula of salt, sugar, and fat that a lot of these um, fast food tycoons have invested billions of dollars to per perfect the formula. With that said, consuming large amounts of lean carbs has actually been shown to have little to no effect on body fat rebound. Now the evidence is scant here, but one study found going with a very low fat and high carb, high protein meal actually led to more muscle mass. Another study found that having 350 to 400 grams of carbs roughly doubled their gains in fat free mass, which is pretty cool. So my suggestion is use lean sources of carbs and lean sources of protein for your novelty meals. Some of my favorite sources are sushi, sherbet, um, a classic bagel with low fat cream cheese, uh, shrimp tacos with using low fat sauces is another good example. Now, if you wanna have a higher fat novelty meal, I would recommend trying to keep it as keto as much as possible. We wanna remove the starchy carbs and sugars from this and stick to the high fats from the meats, nuts, and healthy veggies. So a pan seared steak with some buttered veg is a great option here, or like a, a stir fry is another really good option. But the idea is either high fat, high protein, or high carb, high protein. We don't want a mixture of both. Lastly is don't use hyper palatable, hyper processed foods. Remember the dilemma that we just discussed earlier. Reintroducing hyper palatable foods can just make your journey here more difficult than it needs to be. So if you absolutely want burger or pizza, 
make it at home. This allows for us to control the ingredients and the fat amounts in our food. And you'll find that the food that you make at home can actually be more satisfying when you're done eating it than if you were to get the same thing at a restaurant or through a fast food joint. It's also more satisfying and more enjoying when you can prepare these foods on a date night or with your loved ones. So now, how big should a novelty meal be? The size of the novelty meal is dependent on the magnitude of the deficit. So if your calories are very, very low and you're already very lean, you can get away with a larger meal. If your calories are already pretty moderate and we're losing weight at a relatively low rate and you still have a lot of fat to lose, I would aim for a smaller novelty meal. Essentially, you have to earn the right uh, to a larger novelty meal. And that's gonna come from dieting a little bit longer, getting a little bit leaner, having a little more leeway and flexibility for those uh, larger amounts of calories. So to sum all this up, cheat days are not as magical as people like to make them out to be. I know they're really popular on social media, but you can easily destroy your caloric deficit with one day. The reintroduction of hyperpalatable, hyperprocessed foods actually makes this journey more challenging for you. It doesn't get the cravings out of your system you're just letting the cravings back into your system. A novelty meal is a much more effective way and a strategic way to reintroduce your favorite foods and kind of break up the novelty without completely sabotaging your diet. We do a novelty meal by planning it out at least four days in advance. Once a week is just fine. Timing the novelty meal post-workout because this is when you're primed for growth and not a fat rebound. Trying to use foods that are high carb, high protein, if you absolutely must, you can do a keto approach where it's high fat, high protein, but I would not mix both high carb, high fat. Do not reintroduce the hyperpalatable, hyperprocessed foods. Try to stick to leaner, minimally processed options. The leaner you are and the more aggressive of the diet that you're in, you can get away with a larger novelty meal. The more fat that you have to lose and the more moderate the deficit is, I would do a smaller novelty meal. I hope this helps. Uh, we talk more about how to reintroduce novelty meals and we actually build out the novelty meals for you in our coaching program. You can get more information on that in the links in the description. That's all I've got. We'll see you in the next one.